My name is Trista Lackey, and I am representing the Fairhope Library. I'm interviewing Michael Lackey on Monday, November 22nd, 2021, at the Fairhope Library. Michael Lackey is my father. This interview is being conducted for the Fairhope Library's Veterans Oral History Collection. So, can you tell us what is your date of birth? Uh, 21 April 1946. And which branch of service were you in? Well, I were actually in two, two branches. I was in the Navy first and then the Army. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, what was your highest rank attained? Uh, Master Sergeant. And that was in the Army? Yes, in the Army. Okay. And how about in the Navy? What was your... I was, uh, what do they call it, a radio in second class. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, did you go to war or a conflict? Uh, yeah, I was in, uh, in 1966, I was in, went, sent to Vietnam as a uh, operator on a, on a small river patrol boat called PBRs, and I spent a year, just about a year there uh, from January of 66 to just about the first part of December when I got medevaced out. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, did you, when you, did you ever go to any other conflicts? Well, I was in the Dominican Republic before that for only four days. Oh. That was a year in 1965. It was during the Dominican Republic thing, but it was only four, four days that we went down there. We went in later. They took the Army in there, and uh, we were one of the last follow-up units, and it was basically the situation was all cleaned up then. They were, it was a, basically a toggle between the, uh, the, the government at that time of uh, Haiti. It was more of a revolution. Well, we were asked to help, so the government, U.S. government was asked to help, so we went down there, but it was only a short period of time. Uh, but it was a, considered a conflict. Most veterans were awarded the Armed Forces Extraditionary Medal. Oh, wow, okay. When you joined the military, were you living with your parents and siblings? Yes, I was living with my, uh, my mother and my father and uh, my sister, Patty, and my brother, uh, Jim, who's older than I am, but he was in college at the time. So when I left off, when I went in the first time in the Navy, it was just my uh, sister and my mother and my father. Okay. Did you, so you were, did you leave um, leave high school and join the Navy? Yeah, I, joined, I graduated and went right right in within the next month. I think I went in, in uh, we graduated in the end of May and I went in near the end of June. Oh, wow. Did So you enlisted or were you? I enlisted. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. And so that was in 1964? Yes. May 1964, okay. And then you joined in June. Wow, that was fast, mm -hmm. <laughs> right after mm -hmm. high school. Um, did you have any jobs before you entered the Navy? I had a job while I was in high school, just part-time after work, uh, after I was got out of school, uh, was uh, delivering uh, uh, drugs for a pharmacist. Oh. Uh, you know, it would, uh, they, people would call in and they would take the drugs to, it was older people that couldn't get in. And everything, but it was a part-time job after school. Oh, wow. But that was the only job I had before I went in. Okay. Can you tell us about when you went into the military? Um, like, what made you decide to join the Navy? <clears throat> well, <laughs> funny, I always wanted to go into the military. Uh, when I was a kid and everybody was playing, uh, you know, politically correct uh, uh, cowboys and Indians at that time, you know, uh, I'd always wanted to play soldier. <clears throat> so I decided after high school I was going to go in, uh, but I was going to plan on going into the Army. But uh, <clears throat> in my sophomore year in high school, a, uh, a family transferred up uh, to my high school, and the father had just retired from the Navy. Uh, he was a Master Chief, which is as high as you can go and enlisted. <clears throat> and uh, he had been in the Navy, and they'd just come up from Guantanamo Bay in Cuba. That's where he had been. And uh, Billy. Uh, Stewart was the kid's name, he was the same age as mine. And so we became really good close friends and I was with visiting his parents all the time and his father would tell, uh, tell me about what he did in the Navy and everything, places he had been in. So I kind of decided then, I think I'll go in the Navy, you know. But I just knew I'd always wanted to go in the Army, so I decided to go in the Navy at that time. Wow, that's cool. That's an interesting hmm. way to, to join mm -hmm. and, and a reason to join. Um, so what do you think that your parents and your sister and brother thought about you joining the Navy? 
I really don't know. My sister at that time, she was about four years younger than I was. I'm um, sure she didn't, you know, like me going off or going somewhere, you know, uh, leaving her kind of like, you know, like my brother had gone off to school and everything. <clears throat> but uh, my mother really didn't want me to go. Uh, but she realized I'd been wanting to do it all the time. And, uh, and my father had been in World War II. He was badly wounded in World War II, and so he was kind of like, you know, reluctant, but we weren't at war at that time. So it's kind of like, you know, you could be in sometimes, depending on when, for 15 or 20 years and never see combat. So it was kind of like, well, let's hope nothing happens there. So uh, that's about how they acted. Oh, wow. How did you get to your initial point of entry in the Navy? Like, did you have to go? Well, yeah, I went, uh, I went from uh, Birmingham, uh, where I'd signed up and everything, and to, uh, to Montgomery, Alabama, which was the, the time was called the uh, uh, MEPS, Military Entry Processing Station, and that's where you went through all your testing and uh, background investigations and physical and everything to see if you were able and capable to come and come in uh, and then uh, from there when I was selected I went on flew, we flew to uh, uh, Great Lakes Naval Training Center where we flew to Chicago and the Great Lakes Naval Training Center just just north of Chicago on the on the bay up there so that's how I got there oh okay were you excited about joining the Navy well yeah I was I was excited to, to go off and, and, and do what I you know I've been wanting to do for such a long time so it was apprehensive you know can I cut it and and all of that so I wasn't sure but yeah I really really wanted to go uh, everything so uh, it was it was fine yeah cool uh, what what type of training or schooling did you have when you when you joined? Obviously, you went to boot camp. But <clears throat> yeah, you went to basic training or boot camp. Uh, there, you just learn typical Navy things, uh, you know, uh, shipboard activity. Because uh, uh, it's mainly even if you aren't on a ship, you're going to some uh, base or something like that. You still have to learn. To you go in there and you fight fires. You learn how to fight fires on the ship. How to move and maneuver on the ship. Uh, commands and everything. You're on the ship. You know, uh, uh, and uh, it's just it's just basic uh, navy stuff. Uh, customs, traditions, uniforms, and and all of that stuff. Orders. Uh, and then uh, then I went off to uh, this the, uh, what they call the rating that I had been selected for. It was a radio school. <clears throat> and I went to Maryland for that. It's a base called Bainbridge Naval Training Center. It's not there anymore, but that's where I learned. Went to uh, 26 weeks of uh, radio school there, and you learn how to operate very large transmitters and, and receivers, and uh, learn Morse code, uh, mm -hmm. sending and receiving Morse code, and uh, radio teletypes, is which where we used to send uh, classified messages on that because they were uh, uh, encrypted and everything. But that's what I learned there. And then I went off on to, then from school I went straight to my first assignment, which was Naval Air Station Pensacola. Hmm. And I was at the transmitter site at, uh, there, and a bit, that training or that assignment, we, I talked to ships at sea and, and aircraft, set up transmitters and stuff if, if they needed to transmit a message or relay a message because they couldn't reach a certain place. We of course had, because it was on the, on, on the land, we had much larger transmitters and antennas and everything. And I was only there about five months and then I got selected to go to Vietnam. So oh, okay. I was it was a great assignment, but I didn't there. get to yeah. have fun there so much. So. Yeah. yeah, not as much fun. Um, and then I went from there, I went to uh, California to San Diego uh, to the Naval Amphibious Base there, and that's where we uh, what we call pick up our picked our boats up. We had never seen them before. They were uh, they were mainly purpose for what we were going to do, which was uh, river interdiction, uh, trying to get inside Vietnam, very coastal. We were like two miles out, and then up in the bays and all the rivers as far as we could go, <clears throat> and we were trying to interdict. Uh, uh, contraband uh, that they were shipping from North Korea, you know, North Vietnam down, uh, ammunition, weapons, food, uh, money, any, anything like that. And that's that's what our job was there. Wow. And then when I got I got uh, I got hit over there, got medevaced out uh, to San Diego, and then from there I went on to a ship in uh, uh, Jacksonville Naval Air Station or Naval Base at Mayport, Jacksonville. <clears throat> and I was on my first ship there, which is a destroyer. 
was it and called? It was called the USS English. Oh, okay. And it was no World War II destroyer. Uh, in fact, it had been at the uh, it had been one of the first ships into Tokyo Bay at the end of the war. Oh, wow. <clears throat> and uh, then there, I got the it was uh, getting decommissioned because it was so old. And then I got sent to also stay there to another destroyer, which is a newer destroyer, which was called the USS Perry. Hmm. And that's where I was you know, separated from after I completed my enlistment. Oh, wow. Did you, um, so did you decide while you were on the Perry that you didn't want to be in the Navy anymore, or did you just didn't want to uh, enlist? Well, I got married. I got married uh, in Jacksonville. Uh, met this uh, woman who became my wife, Janice, and your mama. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, uh, and we got married, and then uh, uh, then we uh, had uh, we got married there, and then I decided now I was going to be married because there was a ship lots of times and the ships would go off you know for three or four or five six months what they call deployment and I said oh, I don't want to do that anymore you know so uh, I decided to go ahead and get separated then and I, I got a job I had a all job offer with uh, AT&T uh, to work there uh, in Jacksonville so I got out and stayed there that's what I got out for okay and how long were you working for AT&T I worked for AT and T for about two and a half years, and then we moved. Decided to go on up to where my parents were, uh, Birmingham. Uh, you were born at that time, mm -hmm. and so we all went up to uh, Birmingham. And uh, I was going, and I went to school up there on the GI Bill, uh, learning electronics. Uh, and uh, but, uh, and I was also working at this other company part time. I was going to school and uh, and most full time, and I was going to work at this other company part time. <clears throat> and then uh, we, I just decided I'd been thinking about something, thinking about going, maybe going back into the service, you know, and uh, talk to your mom about it. And I said, I'm thinking about going back into service. What do you think? She said, I've been thinking about the same thing because she liked it while we were in. So it was kind of like, you were, you know, both of us. <laughs> and so I decided this time I wanted to go in the Army. So I wanted to go into infantry. And uh, so. I went back down, tested and everything, and, and shipped off to the Army. Yeah, so, so where did you, so you went to MEPS again? Right, yeah, same, Montgomery, same Montgomery, place. Yeah, so where was your first um, station? Like, where well, did you basic go? training, I went from my bus, there was a lot of us, three buses, we went down to Fort Polk, Louisiana. That's where I went through basic training there for uh, 13 weeks. Wow. And then, uh, then, and then, at the end of basic training, people were going all over the United States, going to their schools and stuff like that. And I had to stay there because that's where infantry training was. Oh. And I did not like Fort Polk. Nobody ever been there and so liked it. <laughs> yeah. And so I stayed there for another 15 weeks, going through infantry training. <clears throat> and then from there, and I had uh, enlisted for Airborne. Uh, so from there, we went to uh, Fort Benning, Georgia, to go through Airborne School which was a four-week school at the time. And then from there, I went to Fort Bragg, North Carolina. Mm -hmm. And that was my first assignment out of basic and AIT and jump school. Did you enjoy working there at Fort Bragg? Yeah, I enjoy, enjoyed it. Fort Bragg. I enjoyed Airborne. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I, re, I really liked it, you know. So I, that's when I had decided, well, basically, I kind of decided when I decided to go back in, I was going to make a career out of it. So, yeah, we, I liked Lake Fort Bragg uh, a lot and uh, then it came time to re-enlist and uh, I said I want to go do something else I want to go and try that we had one unit in Europe the only unit left in Europe that was airborne and that was in Italy and so I re-enlisted and you know, re-enlisted you sometimes you get to choose where you want to go or you can kind of say hey like I'm not re-enlisted unless I get that's about the only time you ever get a choice of what you want to do <clears throat> and so I asked for that and uh, I got it so mm -hmm. And uh, all of us went off to Italy for three years. So, and it was really cool. Yep, it was. <laughs> <laughs> and you enjoyed working there and, and being a, in airborne mm -hmm. there, and you got to go to different places in. in right, right. We went to uh, went to a lot of different places for training, and went to, went to England twice, Germany, uh, uh, Austria, uh, and. Uh, Scotland for uh, just for two weeks for they jumped out of 
got their jump wings, and I got German jump wings. We went to their jump school. It was kind of a trade. We were there. We had different countries there. We had a, they had a battalion like we were air airborne, and we were all what we called sister battalions. So we all kind of trained together because we were all part of what was called at that point in time the Allied Mobile Force. Uh, mobile force in case the Russians ever attacked. We were supposed to be the the first ones to try to stop them before you know we could get everybody else involved in it. But uh, yeah, I, I, I enjoyed being here. I, I enjoyed the Army mm -hmm. a lot. Enjoyed infantry. Yeah, I know it sounds like it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, after Italy, um, where were you stationed? After Italy, we went. To, I was selected to go to uh, recruiting school. <clears throat> so you know, we went all went uh, uh, flew from Italy, got our car in uh, New Jersey, and drove across country to Seattle, where I reported in, and then they turned around and sent me back to Indiana to mm -hmm. to recruiting school. And uh, after uh, I think it was a six week recruiting school, then I went back to Seattle and was given the station at Renton, and uh, that stayed there for three years in, as a recruiter. Mm -hmm. And then after that, back to Fort Bragg another assignment <clears throat> and uh, another unit there was another uh, infantry battalion and then from there I got picked up for uh, for a covert assignment uh, in Maryland uh, and uh, we stayed there for oh I think about two years and then uh, I requested the job I was doing to be, be able to choose certain assignments within a certain field, so I chose to go on what is called embassy duty, uh, working for the uh, what is called the Defense Attaché Office at the American Embassies, and uh, so I chose to uh, go, go there. Uh, I had a, and I could basically pick where I wanted to go, and uh, they had, I think at the time, uh, it was Copenhagen, Paris, and Cyprus. And so I came home and talked it over with you and mother and I thought y'all would want to go to Paris and you fooled me y'all wanted to go to Cyprus and uh, so okay we'll yeah. go to Cyprus but then uh, things didn't work out because uh, something happened in Cyprus where uh, uh, somebody had to be there a lot sooner than I could complete the uh, attache school so then we got uh, either in Copenhagen or Malaysia, and again, y'all fooled me, y'all wanted to go to Malaysia, <laughs> you know, so we went to Malaysia for three years uh, there. And then after that, I went to Korea. You went off to college, you came back to State University, and uh, Mom and I went off to uh, Korea for an assignment there, and then from there, uh, I had started having uh, some acting up with my, uh, situation in Vietnam and uh, so I got kind of medevaced out of there to Fort Sam Houston which is the one of the largest armies which was one of the largest military uh, hospitals and medical centers uh, for an in, for an injury and uh, I stayed there until uh, uh, well it, it was it was finished I got the, the, it fixed and then we I stayed there until I retired mm -hmm. and Retired there, and then we went back to came to Mobile, Alabama. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's basically why we're still here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, what do you think? Uh, do you? What do you think was the um, best part of your training when you were like, let's say, when you were training for the army, like in basic training or? AIT. Infantry training was my, uh, my favorite. It was it was hard. Uh, the uh, drill instructors were hard, tough, very professional, and uh, I enjoyed that a lot because uh, I knew sometime in time we might be able to have to go into combat if I was going to stay in there for some amount of time. Something may start somewhere, so I wanted to make sure that if I went, I was you know very well trained, which we did, mm -hmm. and I also like jump school. You know, there's a lot of physical training in jump school, and it has a it has a pretty high washout rate. People don't make it, uh, and uh, but uh, those were the basically the two things schools I really really enjoyed. Um, did you receive any specialized training? Well, just jump master uh, jump school, and and when I was at Fort Bragg, I was later selected for jump master. The jump master is the one that when the airplane is in flight. 
uh, and it's a parachute operation, then the jump master is in charge basically of the the aircraft and, and everybody on it. He's the one that decides, well, he doesn't decide where they're going, but he decides where the point of impact when he opened the door and get everybody out so that they can land where they need to be instead of miles away and they're not effective. Uh, and uh, that was a that was a long, long course. Uh, well, it was actually short, but it was long. We It's normally a three-week course, uh, I'm sorry, a four-week course, but uh, we were in Italy and uh, we were in a, a battalion there at that time. It just kind of, they were new and we didn't have that many jump master qualified people. And since the only school was qualified to give was in Fort Benning, they selected about 30 of us to go back to Fort Benning for the training. And uh, so we had a condensed course. Normally they started like eight o'clock in the morning to four and we were there at six o'clock in the morning till eight o'clock at night during the winter until they got, we were there from, when light first came up till it got dark and we, of course we were making parachute jumps at night too uh, but it's a it's a big responsibility all those people on there and put them out and you also make sure that all their when they're par when they put all the parachutes on you have to make a it's called, called a J, a jmpi it's a jump master inspection uh, and you have to make sure they got all of their all of their stuff on properly everything's hooked up properly nothing's interlaced or something where you can come up I can come out of the plane and uh, get hung up underneath the plane or he can uh, I mean actually tear his arm off uh, something very bad can happen so you have to make sure and that's what the responsibility is when you can get up there and you're going you're just hoping guy hope, oh nobody gets hurt on my on the jump because of the jump right it was hard but I, I, I enjoyed it a lot yeah I mean, weapons or type of stuff. Yeah. Yeah, I, of course, I was infantry, so you uh, qualify with your basic rifle, which was the M16 at the time. Uh, M16 uh, and your uh, the machine gun, uh, sniper rifles, uh, um, uh, calling in mortar and artillery fire uh, on the radio, how to, how to place the rounds, how to tell the artillery where to move the fire points to. Uh, uh, machine guns, grenades, uh, anti-tank weapons. Uh, uh, you also learned uh, other weapons from, uh, we learned all the weapons with the, uh, at that time it was called the Warsaw Pack, uh, Russia, we learned all of their weapons, what they were capable of doing, because you have to know your enemy. <clears throat> and uh, and also weapons that you, countries you operated with, like Israel sometimes you would operate, you would, you know, they have different weapons that they've invented, using machine gun and stuff like that. So you, you had to learn, train in all those uh, type things, but also explosives, improvised explosives, how to uh, blow up a bridge or something if you come to it and you're trying to blow it up. So yeah, that was type of training. Wow, that's a lot of training. Yeah, it's a lot of training. <laughs> but that's great that you did all that. Um, what do you think was the um, hardest part of the military lifestyle for you, or, or was there any hard um, part of it? I'd say the hardest part was uh, I was lucky and that I didn't have to do it often. Uh, that uh, would be leaving your family for a long period of time. The training, uh, we went off for jungle training and Arctic tra survival training for like a month at a time. and. You were gone from your family then, so you missed them. And of course, uh, would be in the 82nd. Uh, you're the first unit that's deployed to any kind of a combat situation. And when you go, you don't know where you may be on that aircraft before you even know where you're going or what it's for. It could be a training exercise. I mm mean, -hmm. um, usually by the time you're given your uh, ammunition and everything, it's either going to be blanks or it's going to be live ammunition and if it's live ammunition then you don't know you're going into a real world situation you may not know where it is so they tell you but your job is to to land there and perform the mission they tell you to do so uh, that was probably the the hardest part yeah Did training wasn't hard because physical training wasn't because they they get you physically trained and everything so that's not really a a big thing you're always doing that that's something you're always doing mm -hmm. so yeah um, you did say that you had or you had gone to um, Grenada and that type of thing happened where you didn't know where you were going. Right, right. You know, we had, uh, there was a situation going on in Grenada in, in the Caribbean uh, that you, know, you weren't really that 
that interesting. It's a little tiny island down there. It was kind of more of like a civil war between some uh, there, but then the, the uh, Cubans were sent there. Uh, Cubans sent one of some of their military units there to bolster the government side. And so apparently we decided, uh, well, with, with the Caribbean countries, they had a meeting and they decided that they wanted to do something about it, but they needed our help. And so we decided to go down there and help. But you know, we didn't know that until, uh, and we were always having exercises where, you know, you're called in at two o'clock in the morning or something and you go in and you don't know if it's a real world thing or just a training exercise. So you get ready, you, the 82nd Airborne Division is from the time you are notified that something's going on, you've got to assemble 72 hours later, you're on the ground wherever you are anywhere in the world. Mm. Uh, nobody else can do, get there that fast because all the heavy equipment goes by ships and gigantic planes and stuff. most of it goes by ship or it's prepositioned. But uh, so we went in that morning, it was a night exercise and uh, they had shut down the entire division, they had MPs everywhere, so we kind of figured oh, something, this is not normal, normal going on and then there was uh, uh, airlift uh, kind of planes we jumped out of, C-140s and C-130s at the time, pouring in there and leaving. And we said, this is completely unusual, something going on, you know. And so later, you know, uh, we deployed, Our, my unit deployed uh, as a follow -on, one of the follow-on units. And as I said, I told you earlier you know, that, that when we got down there and they were issuing out the equipment, and it was live ammunition. So. We knew, hey, we're going off to fight somebody. We don't know where it is, but probably down there, you know. And and now we heard we heard some more stuff, and the more Cubans were going down there. So we said this may be a situation, and it was. So, but that's that was just a, a situation in the 82nd that you mm -hmm. you just dealt with. You knew it was going to happen sometime. You just didn't know if it was a real one or a exercise again. Yeah. How did you feel when you retired from the army? Well, I'd, I'd rather have stayed in, uh, but and I w would have been able to stay in except uh, after uh, after Desert Storm, which I was still in there. It was the first part of that. We, we was I was at Fort Sam Houston. Uh, and we were uh, mobilizing all of the uh, hospital units and uh, medical people that were coming in from all over the United States. All the uh, MASH, Mobile Armored Surgical Hospitals, and General Hospitals and they were all sent there because uh, that's the Army's uh, uh, medical training center where they train all the medical uh, professions. <clears throat> and uh, But when they came back, that's when uh, Congress decided that hey, peace had broken out all over the world and the Berlin Wall had fallen, so we didn't need a military anymore. <clears throat> so they decided to just uh, cut it, you know, and normally you would go in the way the other services did, uh, was cut it out by uh, uh, looking at records and everything, how people had performed, what was, you know, their assignment, their appraisals all during the, the time, what kind of assignments they had had. And you kind of pick, you got a chance to kind of look and maybe possibly pick the very best you had and some that were not quite, they would be put out. But the Army just decided that it was kind of like you'd been in a certain amount of time, you had to go. And uh, unfortunately, my time for that rank, uh, not just you had been in a certain amount, it was rank, you have a rank. If you had been in that rank for so many years, or and in the military for so many years, or the Army for so many years, uh, you had to go. And so when it came up, I had, uh, I had not quite, I had boarded uh, for uh, the next highest rank, uh, but, they said, oh, this date, which was my 20, 26th year, uh, I hadn't made it yet because they hadn't announced the thing yet. Mm -hmm. I was gone. So that's how I got out. So I was bitter about that. Yeah. Uh, and But uh, he said, this is what I've been handed. This is what i got to deal with. So we went back to uh, uh, Mobile, and uh, <clears throat> I got a, I took a job uh, working with uh, in the... Uh, uh, securities uh, business with uh, Smith Barney, uh, selling securities, uh, 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 bonds, and mostly mutual funds and insurance and stuff like that. 
<clears throat> and then uh, your mother, who was working for civil service, uh, Army, she got transferred to uh, Fort Benning, Georgia, which is funny because where I started out my mm -hmm. Army career. She was transferred there. She was in personnel, and they were setting up a new uh, regional center there. So we went there, and uh, I got a job there uh, at, at Fort uh, Benning, uh, working as a... Uh, in civil service also, so I was run, helping to run the range, the, mili the the ranges out there, the gun ranges and stuff. So I was around the military all the time then, so it, it didn't really bother me that thing. I was basically doing the same thing, and uh, we were using the same, you know, uh, etiquette. And the esprit de corps was in the army, and and so I, that didn't make me miss it because I was involved in it and other things, doing the same thing. So. Uh, it didn't bother me as much as it would have a lot of people. Uh, it got out and just didn't know plans whatsoever, or you know things just didn't work out for them, or, or, or things like that. So, uh, and working for the government, uh, you know, aren't you aren't subject to basically you aren't subject to the downturn in the economy as so much as you are because basically the government's got to keep running, you know. Uh, so. Uh, but no, I was I was bitter at first because of the way they did it. Mm -hmm. But after that, no, it didn't bother me. I just proceeded on <laughs> until I retired again. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> after li after working in, with the Navy, the Army, Navy, then the Air Force. Yeah, I was. I ended up I ended up working mm -hmm. for the Air Force in uh, mm -hmm. in uh, England Air Force Base. Yep. Well, I retired a second time. Yep. And before that was the Navy. Yep. <laughs> yep. So you you were a civilian, but you were also working yep. with. The and I also military. worked for what I was in the embassy. Do I worked for the Defense Intelligence Agency? Mm -hmm. So I had kind of hit all the services. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's for sure. Of course, mother worked for the State Department mm -hmm. uh, and the Navy. So. Yep. <laughs> so um, did you do you ever keep in contact with anyone that you knew in the military? Not really, because like I said, when I the time I got out the first time, everything computers were just just coming on board. And mostly they were word processors. We didn't have mobile phones or anything like that. And and I was still in, you know, for a long period of time and moving countries, states, and everything else. So you didn't really have the only thing you had to do was write letters and stuff. And and uh, they would move, I would move. Somebody you just you just lost contact, lost an address or something like that. Didn't know how to to find them. You couldn't look them up. You know, like I said. And you know, except for later on, I had some friends that were really, really good friends, you know, uh, that I had uh, and kept in contact for them for, for quite a while. And uh, a couple of them passed away. And so um, now I don't really have any contact with any of them anymore. Go to a reunion every once in a while, you know, for what unit I was in. But you can't go to every union because you've been in so many units, you know. Yeah. Every unit has a reunion of some kind, you know, so you'd be going to unit. Uh, You'd be busy. Yeah, you know? all the time, so. <laughs> How do you think? How do you think your military service experiences affected your life? Well, I just think it's affected it for the better. Uh, I've uh, got good training. Uh, you know, learning on a new job is, is uh, civilian employees are looking for military people that have retired because they know they've been to, they've got the. They've got the loyalty in the work. They know they're well trained. They've got that esprit de corps. They aren't. Uh, they they go to work every time. Being on, on job, they're not. Uh, they're not averse to learning something new, uh, and uh, they're just very very good loyal uh, workers. Uh, and uh, myself, by going around different countries and living there for such a long time, I've learned how to. Uh, get along with a lot more people. I uh, learn their architecture, their foods, some of their languages, uh, their customs, religions. Uh, so yeah, I think it's made me a made me a better person all around. Yeah, well rounded. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, what are some life lessons you learned from your military service? Well, I just went over some of them. Your your uh, esprit de corps that you have in a, in a un, in, a, in your job. You could have it in a job. It's more of a military type of thing. Your your comrades, you know, that you uh, work with and you you know, live with, fight with. Uh, and, uh, loyalty, uh, loyal to your unit. Uh, again, learning something new. Uh, you just. Uh, it's hard to explain, 
you know, it's kind of, uh, uh, it's like what's a spree, well, I, I can't really describe it, but I know it when I see it, you know, or something like that, you know. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, but, uh, oh no, yeah, I think it's helped me a lot. How has your military service impacted your feelings about war and the military in general? Well, of course, I said the person who hates war most is the person who has to go fight it. Um, but, um, and unfortunately, they happen. Sometimes they're even necessary when you've got people, a country that wants to, wants what this other country's got. and. They were willing to go over and take it by force, and it could be just uh, well. If they took that one, you know, maybe they'll take the next one, and uh, so you may have to go in there and protect your country or or your allies for reasons. Uh, but I don't agree with it, you know. And, and I, of course, been fighting it. I, I I don't want to have to do it again, and I'm hoping, uh, you know. Uh, People behind me don't have to do it, and it would be great if we could go into a long period of peace. Uh, but uh, again, historically, you know, and everything's kind of going on now in the world. Uh, you never can tell. But uh, yeah, I'm uh, I'm against it. But again, if I had to go, uh, I was asked to go. I'll go again. You know. Um, what message would you like to leave for future generations who will view? hear this interview? Well, I'd like them to know what the Army was like, the military, uh, that you do have sacrifices. Uh, it's not a bad way of life for a lot of people. It's not for everybody. Uh, kind of going to my recruiting thing now, but if you're, uh, you know, if you don't have a, you don't know what you want to do, you uh, aren't going to school, uh, you don't know what to do, you might try to give the military a look because they train you, uh, they take care of you, you can learn a lot, go places, visit the people. Uh, but uh, overall, I hope they would think that military people make good civilians afterward because, uh, because of the experiences they've had, maybe the difficulties they've had to cope with, hardships. Uh, but uh, that's basically what I would like for them to know that this generation did it. We had to, uh, we did what we were supposed to do and uh, hopefully they will if they have to, but hopefully they don't have to. Mm -hmm. Is there anything that we haven't talked about or I haven't asked that you wanted to say? No, I can't. I can't think of any anything. Okay. You did a good job. <laughs> Thank you. I All think right. you, you did a good job. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> okay. Well, um, so, yeah, I really appreciate you talking with us and uh, telling your story. Thank you for having me. You're welcome. All righty. Thank you. Thank you. You want to come over for dinner? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sure. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Bye. You're welcome. Bye. <laughs>